PSP is really not so rare a disease as was originally thought. There are about five or six people out of every 100,000 population who have PSP. But in addition, there may be many more who have the earliest subtle signs of the disease and aren't yet diagnosable even by the most expert neurologist. The prevalence of PSP is similar to that of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, known in Europe as motor neuron disease and in the States as Lou Gehrig disease. The way we make a diagnosis of PSP in the clinic on a daily basis has a bit of informality to it. We do use the accepted criteria that have been published, but they're useful mainly when recruiting people to be in a research study. The way we make the diagnosis of PSP on a more daily basis is to use a whole set of signs and uh, appearances that the person has. For example, the person with PSP will have an upright posture, they'll have a contracted face that's been likened to the look of somebody who's just smelled something bad, it looks kind of like that, and they're walking, their gait will have a very distinctive appearance. It'll be an irregular walk, there will be a wide base between the feet as if the person were drunk, and perhaps most important, the person seems relatively apathetic or not caring about how severe their balance problem really is. So they tend to plunge ahead with their unbalanced gait and they can often get into difficulty with that. Other things that PSP can offer by way of diagnostic clues are the very characteristic speech pattern. It's called a spastic speech in combination with an ataxic speech. So the, the speech is very strained and slow. And in addition, the syllables are grouped into unnatural groups with unnatural pauses between them. It's a very distinctive kind of speech that occurs in almost no other condition. So the combination of these things together is a very good clue to the diagnosis of PSP, even in its earliest stages. A complaint of unsteadiness and difficulty in walking is a common presenting feature of PSP. The gait is broad-based, ataxic, and is often unkindly described as the gait of a drunken sailor or a dancing bear. There is often preserved arm swing in contrast to Parkinson's disease, and the gait is frequently reckless in that patients seem to be unaware of the dangers that they are running by getting up quickly from a seated position and moving faster than their brain seems to be able to uh, dictate. This leads to damaging and dangerous falls, particularly backwards. Another complaint is of blurring of vision and occasionally double vision, uh, which can be one of the earliest presenting features of PSP. This is due to a disturbance of eye movements and difficulties in keeping the eyelids open to voluntary control. Some patients will have involuntary eye closure, particularly when talking or watching television, which is called blepharospasm or apraxia of eyelid opening. And others will have difficulties negotiating stairs uh, because of a difficulty in looking down. Eye movements form a particularly important part of the neurological examination in PSP. And the classical findings are of slowness of vertical eye movements together with limitation of eye movements. The formal neurological examination involves the patient being asked to look up, look down, look to the right and look to the left with the examiner monitoring the degree of normal movement and the speed of movement. The patient is then asked to follow an object, either a finger or a pen, up, down, and horizontally. Can you follow the target with your eyes? And finally, the doll's eye movements are tested. These involve flexing the neck with the patient being instructed 
to continue to follow a finger held in the horizontal plane. In contrast to the marked limitation and slowness of eye movements to command and pursuit, doll's eye movements are preserved in PSP, giving a greater extent and range of movements than one sees to the voluntary command. There are a number of other neurological conditions which can masquerade as PSP, and it is obviously important to try and exclude these as much as possible on the history and on the physical examination. In the history, we ask always about a previous history of encephalitis, because some forms of viral encephalitis can uh, look very like uh, PSP, uh, particularly the sleepy sickness of von Economo's disease, although this is now uh, quite a rare disorder. We also ask about a history of visual hallucinations, psychosis, and memory loss, as these are more indicative of a condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, which can also simulate and look sometimes rather like PSP. On the physical examination, it is important to exclude autonomic dysfunction and signs of autonomic failure. This is done by checking lying and standing blood pressures, inquiring about whether the patient is still able to perspire and sweat normally, and also in inquiries about bladder function. Uh, these sorts of symptoms are more commonly associated with Parkinson's disease and a neurodegenerative disorder called MSA, which is much rarer, but which can look very like PSP, particularly in the early stages. Uh, it is also important to exclude uh, a related condition to PSP called cortico-basal degeneration, sometimes abbreviated to CBD. In contrast to PSP, this condition usually begins in one limb and is very asymmetrical. Uh, the limb usually has jerky, tremulous movements in it and may be, uh, have the features of what is called an alien limb. Uh, this is a symptom where the limb of a patient feels as if it doesn't anymore belong to them and it will carry out uh, unwanted movements against the voluntary control of the patient. Uh, these are all very important things that need to be uh, eliminated uh, before one can go on to saying that this is PSP. The formal diagnostic criteria are quite simple. Number one, the person has to be older than 40 at the onset. There has to be gradual progression of the signs and symptoms. In other words, they would have to get worse as time is going by. There, has to be, there have to be falls in the first year. Um, if the falls are much delayed, it would, might mean some other diagnosis. And there has to be vertical gaze palsy, in other words, difficulty looking up or more specifically looking down. In addition, there has to be an absence of evidence for competing diagnostic possibilities. The clinical investigations I use routinely in patients suspected of having PSP are very few. There are no blood tests or any other chemical investigations that are important. The only thing I order consistently is an MRI of the brain. Occasionally, I will also order a SPECT scan of the brain to look at blood flow and uh, decreased metabolic activity in the frontal areas.